So we look around us, we see all sorts of ordinary stuff. And then we look out in the universe and we see other planets, stars, galaxies, clusters of galaxies, walls of galaxies, all kind of lighting up. But then we learn that this is only a small fraction, maybe a, a, a fifth or so of, of, of the matter that really exists. And it's, it, and it's astonishing. Uh, as an observational cosmologist, you have looked at the history of the universe really for almost a, what, a 10 billion year period and, and looking at it during this period. How has dark matter, this new stuff that we can see but really is there, how, how has that figured in, in, in your observations? In some sense, that was what got the whole ball rolling in, 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 this, in this game because we were, we were really very interested in this question of if we already have a, a lot of matter that we can't account for. Um, and it seems to make up, oh, you know, what, 20, 30 percent of what it might take to slow the universe to the point that it would come to a halt and collapse. Um, maybe we should be looking at the biggest, biggest possible measurement and, you know, weighing the whole universe and finding out, is there more of that stuff out there? And in fact, making up this critical density of, of, of mass. The critical density being that amount of matter uh, less than which would not be sufficient to resist the continual expansion of the universe, greater than which would cause it all to come back together, and exactly that would kind of slow and even the, the universal exactly. expansion. So that, that, that's what you were looking for. Right, right, exactly. And uh, there was thought that, well, maybe you know, these, these particular measurements that people have done so far, looking at you know, galaxies uh, you know, orbiting around clusters of galaxies, that, it, that that was not capturing all the dark matter out there, and that if we were able to make a measurement that was global in some abstract sense uh, of, of the whole universe, maybe we could actually um, catch the rest of it in action. I mean, your phrase, weighing the universe, it just brings us, can't help but bring a smile to, to my face because it, it's just such a simple term like, you know, weighing this gadget. Uh, but you're weighing the universe. No, exactly, exactly. You know, you wake up in the morning, and I go to work, what do you, what's your, what do you do? Well, I'm, I'm weighing the universe. And, and I think we love that. We, lo we love the idea that we were actually getting to do something like, like that, and, but doing it, you know, a prosaic thing, which was just measuring, okay, how much is the universe slowing down uh, because of all of the stuff in the universe? And that would tell us how much stuff there was. So that was going to be great. And that was, you know, how the whole thing began. Now, it, along the way, as we started working on it, um, there were other... Th uh, strains of theories floating around. And it was pointed out to us um, during that period uh, that if you are weighing the universe in this particular way by seeing how much the universe is slowing down, you could be fooled because there was something else that you could put into the equation, um, which would be a energy in all of empty space um, that you, at the time, we were calling it the cosmological constant. It's called vacuum energy. And today, we we'll, you would call it dark energy. And the worry was, well, um, if you are measuring this slowing the expansion, but it's not slowing quite as much as you thought. Maybe it's because there's less matter um, in the universe, or maybe it's because there's a little bit extra of this energy in empty space that's trying to push the expansion out. And how are you going to tell those apart? And so in the early periods of this project, we started looking into, well, how could you distinguish the two? And it turned out that the effect of the energy of the, uh, you know, in the vacuum that could be pushing out to expand the universe faster um, uh, and its, its relationship to the effect of the gravity pulling in was a little bit different at different, at different distances away from us. So if you could find, do this measurement, not only at you know, one set of distances, but at a much broader range of distances, you might be able to tease the two effects apart. And that's one of the things that we started to try to do. So we were making a measurement using these exploding stars, supernova, and we started realizing that we don't just need supernova in this distance range, you know, maybe going out some three billion years uh, of history, but we need to actually go back some 10 billion years and more to be able to try to pull apart um, these two effects, and that was one of the things that we started to do. As a result, you've obviously uh, shown that there is 70% of the total mass density energy of the universe is dark energy, uh, but another 25% or so is this dark matter, and then four or five percent are just ordinary matter. But what have you learned more about dark matter in this process? Well, this, of course, told us you know, that the earlier measurements of, uh, of rough amounts of dark matter that you got from orbiting you know, galaxies orbiting uh, you know, around each other and around uh, clusters um, wasn't far off. 
um, that it was actually a pretty good measurement. And so in some sense, it um, told you that you didn't need to go looking for even more um, exotic forms of dark matter, that the ones that we were, the oddities that we were already looking for were, were the one, were, was the entire story. So what you're saying is that the original concept of dark matter came from the speed of rotations of galaxies around each other or, or orbital stars within galaxies, and we knew there had to be more matter there to account for the, these velocities. Uh, what you're saying is that the data you, you have comes from a completely different uh, point of view. Yeah and comes to a similar kind of conclusion because that's, when that happens, you, you feel terrific because if, right. if, if, if only one methodology gets you the, the answer, uh, then it may be it's some problem with the methodology. No, but precisely. It, it, so the fact that we now have lines of evidence uh, that come together from many different sources, they bolster each other. And so the evidence that, you know, that we have makes it clearer that this amount of dark matter is really what we have to deal with. But of course, that evidence also helps along with other data sets to make it clear that we do have the amount of dark energy that we see. So they all help each other in, in getting some sense of clarity that this part of the story looks like it's, it's, it's understood. How do you actually do it in terms of the dark energy? And, and, and is it by this teasing apart of dark energy and dark matter so that you can see when the effect is a, a, of each to, get, to, to quantify the dark matter? How, you, how do you do that? I mean, you can do it in several different ways. Um, and the, uh, the one that was the first to be done was to say, our measurement is really measuring the, the difference between the dark energy and the dark matter. Um, in other words, the you know, one's trying to pull, the other's trying to push, um, in some you know, abstract sense, the expansion of the universe. And, and so whatever we measure, it's going to be the difference between the two. Okay. There's another measurement, uh, which is uh, seen actually in that glow left over from the Big Bang that we call the cosmic microwave background, um, which is actually a pretty good measurement of the total amount of energy in the universe. Okay. Um, and so it's measuring the sum of the two. <laughs> so if you have the difference and you have the sum, you now have a way of pulling them apart. And, uh, and you know, the, simple, the simple algebra now tells you uh, that you know each one separately. So you are able to, in your work, uh, really discern 95% of the universe. Everything that we don't see, you can, you can show us with your fairly simple number of data points. I mean, it's not millions of data points. No, that's right. You, you that's have right. a few data points of these supernova. You can now describe 95% of reality. I mean, and what you All have... All the rest of us <laughs> spend, uh, you know, thousands of years of human history, and we're only dealing with 4 or 5%. <laughs> but, it's, but it's one of these things where the leverage you get by, you know, being able to you know, use modern-day instrumentation to look out so far means that every one of those very distant supernova we had um, became very valuable, that each one of them gives you a huge lever arm on a measurement mm -hmm. and, and allows you to start pulling, pulling out this kind of information that you otherwise couldn't imagine how you could find. So your confidence level that in this universe, literally 25% of the total energy density is dark matter, 70% approximately is dark energy, and only 4 or 5% is ordinary matter. The stuff you, that we you, are. Yeah. You, yeah, you have a high confidence level that that's pretty good. Yes. And I say that with a little asterisk because um, this is in the simple picture of the universe that we're working with today. And there are ways in which you can, you can think about it where you'd say, ah, that's because we're looking at it in this particular way. If we come at it from a completely different theoretical framework, it could be that you'll interpret the same results in a slightly different way or a dramatically different way. But um, that would... That would be the next chapter of our story. That would be um, after we learn enough more that we're able to re-conceptualize what we're talking about. It wouldn't mean that what we are saying today is wrong. It would mean that it was a, uh, it was a, you know, we were understanding this slice this way and that it's part of a bigger story that we then will get to see.